Hello friends, in the last class we have seen some examples from the Indian Institute of Science what the undergraduate students have done in as part of the humanities curriculum. We have seen how art is brought together with science and technology and what new things are created bringing these two together. The point was to show you that, that it is indeed uh, 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 possible to have a dialogue between the arts and the science and technology. This was to show you that a meaningful dialogue, a meaningful exchange can happen when you bring two, these two disciplines together. Uh, so, in the last two classes that we are going to have, I wanted to point out the important points of this course. So, in the next two classes, we will see what are the important take home points from this course. course. So, let us begin recapitulation. So, we began with the idea that the science and the humanities are two discrete disciplines and a very little interchange uh, is happening in the present times. We do not see any you know uh, interchange between them, we do not see a dialogue between them, we do not see anything you know coming out from these two disciplines together. The point of this course was to bring two this, uh, these two disciplines, discrete disciplines together that are thought to be very separate, very you know uh, different and see what are the responses that is created when you bring these two domains of knowledge together. The two domains of knowledge science and humanities are seemingly different, while certainty and accuracy are the attributes of science, humanity advocates creativity and crit critical thinking. Science is the study of natural world, whereas humanities is the study of human civilization and culture. So, we began with that saying that in the present times, these two domains of knowledge are you know kept uh, separate from each other, we do not uh, bring them together, we do not you know un try to understand them uh, in, in the same way, uh, but uh, so, so, but what happens if we try and bring them together and try and make a uh, dialogue between them. So, this was the point uh, that we started with and that was the focus of the course that we are trying to have a uh, you know co um, correlation between the two discrete domains of knowledge. So, then we began with uh, discussing about the origin of disciplines. We have seen that in the you know uh, in the very early times there was hardly any difference between you know there was hardly distinction between disciplines everything came under the uh, you know bracket of education, everything was taught under the bracket of education. So, that a uh, uh, individual is a well rounded individual, but as the as time progressed there was uh, you know changes happened and uh, discipline originated, but uh, there are plus points about having disciplines that you you know become uh, expert in certain field, but there are minus points also when you you know uh, are unaware of what is happening in the other disciplines, because you are not aware of the full picture. So, we then discuss what how the disciplines originated, how this you know, two domains of knowledge the science and the humanities became separate from each other. The 1800s started to see the development of the modern disciplinary system, the disciplines that we know today started as scholars specializing in a field of interest as knowledge along with communities grew, the need for professions grew as well and these communities and professions carved out the academic discipline. So, this is how it started gradually. Mathematics and music were some of the first disciplines that were taught in the Greek era. In the evolution of education, when Plato opened his academy, he taught social issues such as politics and education alongside the already established disciplines of mathematics. Continuing with established disciplines, the Roman decided to focus more on discipline of law. The earliest university in Europe in the uh, 1000 to 1100s uh, taught such disciplines that were occupationally based, especially in a religious sense. Through the evolution of the discipline, a mere 200 years after the first university in Europe was established, it was determined that higher education should evolve either theology, uh, either theology law or medicine as well as the arts. With the growth of education, the university started to see the development of professional schools which specialize in law or medicine, academic societies and journals emerged. So, this is the development that happened at different part of the world and in different times and how you know disciplines came to emerge uh, in, in, uh, and they have, they have quite uh, different, uh, different trajectories in different parts of the world. The development of the discipline we know today have been an ongoing process since the beginning of human communication. The basic of knowledge formed into specialization, which eventually turned into the disciplines. 
from various consultation of like minded scholars. The basic discipline that we know now such as fine arts, humanities, social science and science, sciences and mathematics are still ever changing. So, gradually things became more uh, you know uh, specified people started to uh, you know uh, take interest in specified field of knowledge and this is how disciplines originated. But uh, um, you know the policies and all also have been made in the you know as time progressed to keep all these disciplines separate from each other. <coughs> so, is there a crisis? Uh, do you do you think there is a crisis when we do not make the discipline talk to each other, when you do not provide a platform so that the, the disciplines can come together and have a meaningful dialogue? Is there a crisis? Do we, do we see a crisis there? The world view that the natural and human sciences are mutually exclusive has led to many crises than one. This is a very you know uh, well accepted uh, uh, idea that because we have made the discipline so discrete, so separate from each other, so distant from each other and removed from each other that there it has led to many crises. Especially in the globalized world we are living in, we, it is necessary that uh, you know we have we are cognizant, we are aware about the developments that are happening in different disciplines. So, to have a holistic picture of the world. This has restricted flights of imagination and limited creativity. This character of our imagination has restrained and restricted individuals right from primary education and continues till the higher education level. So, this is a uh, you know this is a um, uh, uh, you know quite often lamented that because we have kept the discipline so removed from each other it has restricted flights of imagination it has not been able to provide us education has not been able to provide us with a complete holistic picture of the world. So, what is the aim of this course? Why are we in you know having an interdisciplinary course? The aim of the course is not to use the folk art as mere medium of communicating science and technological innovations, but it is to demonstrate that both art and science are at par with each other and can interact with one another to produce novel creations. So, I have been telling this again and again that we are in this course we are not trying to just merely show that science and technology can be represented effectively by art, but we are trying to do something more than that. We are trying to see that the art and the sciences and the technology are at par with each other and they both have a scope to you know represent each other effectively or have uh, you know they can share and borrow from each other effectively. This is in accordance with interdisciplinary approach where two domains of knowledge come together share and borrow to create something new. So, we are actually trying to do a interdisciplinary kind of you know uh, 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 investigation or you know uh, discussion or exploration where we see that when two domains of knowledge come together the you know product that is created is the does not belong to one discipline itself, but it is something new you cannot call that it belongs to only one discipline but it is something new and it is very radical and different from the two disciplines that have created it. So, what are we trying to do here with this course? We are actually trying to push disciplinary boundaries. So, then we started our discussion regarding humanities and arts because uh, this course was about art and science and technology. So, we uh, uh, try and we discussed what uh, how art em emerged and what relationship it has with humanities. Uh, we have seen some of the you know uh, scholars from the field talking about uh, what their perception about the humanities and arts. The arts are part of the humanities, the humanities are part of the arts, they are mixed, mingled and gloriously interdependent. The historians who create a turn of phrase that perfectly captures our relationship to our past is an artist. The actor who sits in a bar after a show and dissects the audience's reaction to their performance is a humanist. I do not know how useful it is to draw a distinction between the two, but I do know that it is essential to celebrate both. So, this is a you know very famous thing saying uh, by Ron Scott Fry that uh, uh, they are not uh, you know uh, different from one another and uh, they might be different or they might not be different, but what is important is that we see the significance of both and we uh, you know celebrate both. Then we discussed uh, what art is, what art entails. Art is a human activity which explores and thereby uh, creates new reality in a super rational visional manner and presents it symbolically or metaphorically as a microscopic whole signifying a macroscopic. 
So, this is what art means, it is a human activity which represents the world in a very uh, you know in a precise uh, symbolic uh, manner. What makes an object art? What are the you know what are the features that would call uh, what would that a object would be called an art? What are the features the object has to have to be called an work of art? So, we discussed that we discussed that it has to have, have these four qualities that is creativity, skill, engagement and meaning. Creativity entails a uh, aesthetic representation, the um, how the imagination of the artist or the person who is creating the art is aesthetically represented. So, that is creativity, skill is the tools or by you know the talent by which the artist uh, is able to execute his thoughts or his imagination. Engagement is that the work of art has to have a you know uh, this you know a dialogue with the person who is observing uh, this work of art. It has to you know engage or captivate the person. Uh, you know it has to tell something to the person who is observing it. Meaning the work, the piece of object to be called an art has to have some meaning. It is it is not uh, you know a random thing. It has to convey some meaning and it has to be you know uh, a so uh, a, a pro, you know a source of communicating communicating some ideas so these are the four things that would entail uh, an object to be called as a art then after that we discussed the seven elements of art line shape space value form then color uh, a line as we see is when a dot moves from one point to another the path it creates is called a line shape is when a line crosses a line you know uh, crosses another line or the end of one line meets its uh, you know uh, the beginning of one line meets its own end then it a shape is created when a shape uh, uh, you know attains the thi third dimension it is it you know it becomes a uh, 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 form then uh, space is where the uh, room uh, 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 in that object it occupies uh, that is called the space value is the you know the uh, tone the you know uh, the tone of a, a hue is the value it might be dark, uh, la, uh, dark or it might be light depending upon the amount of whiteness or that you know uh, blackness in it that is the value um, texture is the how the you know object feels what is the uh, you know um, uh, surface feels like that is the texture colors as we know are the different hues the different you know uh, variation of uh, uh, you know hues that is the color so these are the seven elements of art which uh, you know artists have uh, experimented with the seven elements to create their own uh, individual uh, signature styles and uh, you have seen artists you know doing uh, experiments with line experiment with shapes experiment with space values and they have created their own individual piece of work, piece of art. Then we came to folk art as this uh, course is about Indian folk art, we then discuss what is the relationship of art and folk art, uh, what is the difference and what is the correlation um, uh, you know that art and folk art have. So, uh, a folk art is not a general art, it has certain uh, you know uh, features, it has uh, certain qualities. Uh, so, we discuss the qualities that we discuss the you know uh, you know uh, the essential qualities of folk art. So, we had, had uh, initially uh, said that a folk art is a creation of a community, it entails it you know in its essence is it has the cultural uh, you know values of a community, it belongs to a folk community. So, it may be decorative or utilitarian, may be used every day or reserved for high ceremonies, is handmade, it may include handmade elements as well as new synthetic or recycled components may be made for use within a community of practice or it may be produced for sale or as a form of income and empowerment, may be learned formally or informally, folk art may also be self taught, may include intangible forms of expressive culture like dance, song, poetry and food ways is traditional, it reflects shared cultural aesthetics and social issues, it is recognized that as traditions are dynamic traditional form art 
forecast may change over time and may include innovations in traditions is of by and for the people all people inclusive of class status culture community ethnicity gender and religion so uh, forecast is essentially a product of a community a product of a group and it uh, carries all, all the you know uh, essential elements to be recognized as a product from that group so it is actually a uh, tradition traditional uh, you know uh, pr product of the particular group So, we also discussed the classification between classical folk and contemporary, this was done to uh, you know uh, distinguish and to better understand what is what is folk and what it is not. So, we made a distinction between classical folk and contemporary to see to understand better uh, what a folk uh, art is. So, classical is uh, anything that is written and codified, I mean a classical art has to be written and codified, it has a strict code of uh, you know, uh, strict, it's strictly codified. Folk is loosely structured, and uh, uh, contemporary incorporates a range of different styles to create its own unique look. Classical is formally learned. Uh, folk is passed orally. Uh, contemporary is self-taught. In classical, author is always known. Uh, folk. This is a very you know important distinction that the author may be unknown. And and contemporary, it's very individualistic. Uh, classical represents a nation, uh, folk represents a region, and contemporary is transnational. That is, it uh, you know it crosses the uh, national boundary, and it is it talks about humanity or it talks about issues. <coughs> classical survives time. Folk also survives time, uh, whereas we have seen in contemporary, it's uh, you know relatively short lived. Classical is uh, may have spiritual philosophical themes, folk may be uh, mostly it is natural cycle mundane themes, contemporary is topical themes, classical is selected participants because it is, it is codified it is highly standardized only a few people understand the code only a few people trained in that culture understand the code. So, the participant is very selected. Whereas, in folk everyone participates, we have seen uh, you know in the entire community participating in a artwork you know in a dance or in a song. So, uh, you do not need a formal uh, training uh, for uh, folk art. Contemporary selected participants, again it is because it is individualistic, one has to understand the code uh, the you know the language of that art to uh, you know effectively understand that uh, you know form. So, it is uh, selected participants again. So, we again uh, drew a distinction between fine arts and folk art, what is the what are the difference and what are the points of difference between fine art and folk art. Fine art focuses more on aesthetic and is learned through formal instruction and training while folk art encompasses one culture in a deeper manner, folk art is mostly learned without formal training. So, this is the uh, most important distinction that uh, folk artists do not go to a school to learn the form of art, they learn it by observing the elders or the other members in the family. In folk art context is important, so uh, the where the art is coming from, the region, the you know location, the you know cultural background, it is very important and it uh, that art talks about all this, the region it is coming from, the location it is coming from. Folk art of la, uh, uh, folk art are largely utilitarian. So, a folk art are um, mostly made for use, it is not made for aesthetic you know pleasure, uh, mostly they are use, uh, made for uh, use you know utilitarian purpose like baskets and all, they they made for using, but because they look good they are also considered as art. They said that if the utilitarian purpose is more it is called a craft, if the aesthetic you know uh, expression is more it is called an art. Folk art is weaved into everyday life, so it is you know it is not a it is not removed from everyday life, it is part of everyday life of the people. Folk art connects the past to the present, so it talks about the past you know it is uh, traditionally you know handed over it is a heritage that is traditionally had handed over from generation to generation, so it connects the past to the present. Folk art reflect the worldview of the community. This is very important that when you look at a folk art, 
you understand what the community whole importance. So, you understand the values of the community. So, it is uh, said that folk art gives you a window to the community life. It helps you to understand the community from uh, inside out rather than outside in. So, this is how uh, folk art is important that it is a window to the life of the community. Functions of folk art serve as educational tool for preliterate society. It was believed that you know this uh, the values that the folk art contains and are passed from generation to generation they contain certain educational you know messages certain you know uh, values that the probably the elders want to give to the younger ones. So, they have education they are used as educational tool where formal education is not uh, you know present. But even if formal education is present, there are lot of folkloric material, uh, you know, which are passed on from generation to generation to instill, uh, you know, values from the older one, older generations to the younger generation. Guides and advices and passed on knowledge that are essential for living. So they are like, you know, guides. Uh, they are like, you know, your life, uh, life tools, like life lessons that are passed on from elder people to the younger people that would be necessary for them to uh, in their in a in their lifetime. Emphasize values of the culture. So, they are symbolically telling about what the community holds important what does you know when you are saying that do not lie, do not you know rob others, do not cheat others, be kind. They are actually you know uh, and telling they are telling the younger ones to, that uh, this community holds this values important. highlights the social and political order of the society. So, whatever the society is going through, uh, you know, socially and politically, the folk art gives you a glimpse of it. Explains the inexplicable. So, there are many things uh, like the, you know, uh, like you are not able to explain, like, you know, uh, uh, in the older olden times, people were not able to explain the lightning or they were not able to, exp you know, uh, explain uh, natural calamity. So, there are stories around them which would enable them to understand or to decipher or to explain to the younger ones why this phenomenon has happened. So, they try to explain the inexplicable, the mythological the stories, the you know folk tales that would tell you how, why this kind of things exist. Reflect the fear, anxiety, and gratitude, etcetera. So you know they mostly you know talks about the human emotions. They talk, they reflect you know the anxieties, the fear, the gratitude emotions of the people. And they are also entertainment. Uh, they are you know spoken or they are created to you know uh, entertain to you know for amusement, for to give you a relief from the mundane life. So they all their entertainment is also a very important element of folk art. So, then uh, we discussed the Indian schools of painting, we said that there are there are many uh, various types of painting, but uh, two prominent schools uh, in, of Indian paintings, there is the mural style and the miniature style. Uh, so, mural you will find in, uh, in the caves of first or Satavaha period, caves of the second or Vakataka period. Vak caves, Badami, Pallava, Pandya, Chola, Vijayanagar, Naika. So, here you will see the murals, um, you know, in, in these places and the different styles of the murals uh, in these places. Miniature painting, the Pala, Jaina, Mughal, Rajasthan, Orissa, Pahari, Deccan, there are the different styles of miniature painting. Then uh, we discussed the various uh, folk. Uh, art the folk paintings of India. We you know uh, went through uh, Madhubani, Vali, Gon, Bheel, Patachitra, Patwa, Pichwai, Chitra, Ganji, Fafad, Sohrai, Kalamkari, Kaligat, Shariel painting, Pithoda, Shaura, Kurumba, Meena, Kolam. So, these are the names of different this list is not exhaustive, but these are a few names of the uh, Indian folk art, Indian folk paintings. So, uh, then we went on to discuss certain techniques of a uh, few of the Indian folk art. So, we discussed Madhubani, <coughs> so 
So, we said that uh, uh, they are either floor painting or wall mural done during festival and important occasion, primarily a woman's art and a spiritual practice passed on from generations after generations by observation and learning, mythological events, creations and fertility, uh, social activities, festivities, geometric patterns and natural elements are the central theme. Natural colors from rice powder, flowers, soil, stone, etcetera are used to draw with twigs, fingers or matchsticks. So, this is these are certain features of uh, Madhubani painting. Uh, Madhubani art is done uh, in uh, the Mithila region uh, which falls in Bihar of India and certain parts of Nepal. So, techniques of Madhubani we discussed, we saw that there are three styles, there is Bharni style, there is uh, uh, Kachini style and there is Geru style. So, this is the uh, example of Bharni style of Madhubani. So, it uh, Bharni means filling that is it is a composition with color fields. In this style of painting the subject is outlined with black and the enclosed areas are filled with vibrant colors like blue, yellow, pink, green, orange etcetera. The subjects are represented in flat two dimensional forms and the colors applied flat without any shading. The skillful artist strike right balance between the pattern and color. Though no shading technique is used, the outline is done with double lines and the gaps between the two lines filled with crisscross or straight lines. Hindu deities like Krishna, Rama, Shiva, Durga, Lakshmi, Saraswati, Thanavanti are the common themes. Very special importance is given to Radha Krishna and Krishna Ras Leela. The figures are angular and boldly outlined with bulging fish like eyes and pointed nose, while ultramarine blue is used essentially for figures of Krishna, Rama, Shiva, tones of yellow are used for Radha, Sita, Parvati. The figures are juxtaposed at means colorful ornate flowers, leafy branches, twisting vines and birds, the sun, the moon, the sacred tulsi and basil. So, these are the important uh, you know uh, features of Bharni style of Madhubani. Then this is Kachni style, Madhubani style. Kachni means lines, it is uh, black and white and uh, composition. In this style of painting only one or two colors example black or vermilion is used. The artist draw the fine patterns using hatching and stippling to create paintings with the finest details. Double lines are used to depict the outlines and the gaps between the lines are filled with crisscross or tiny straight lines. Themes are of flowers, fish, snakes in union, bamboo groves, birds etcetera symbolizing fertility and life. This form is appreciated for the complex rendition of details. Then is the Geru style. The Geru, Gobar or Godna styles are originally banned from representing religious motifs and themes. Flora and fauna used to be commonly drawn in this style, but with time Hindu gods and goddesses are also painted in this style. The style commonly painted trees, creepers, flowers and mold, molded low relief clay figures of deity and animals on external walls of their homes. The most popular and important one among this is the tattoo style painting or godna or limbs on limbs and chest of people. They include an auspicious and pro protective image on the human body mostly having rows and concentric cir circles of flowers, fields, animals and deities done initially by bamboo paint and lamp black ink. So, friends today we have gone through some important pro points that we have gone through in the course. We will continue this in the next class and see what are the other important points that we have done in this course. So, see you in the next class. Bye-bye.